up now! Stand up! Stand up! The Ohio man accused of shooting his three young sons to death appeared in court this week as the judge deals with a flurry of legal motions. We're bringing you the three biggest updates from Monday's hearing. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. Over now to Ohio, where 32-year-old Chad Dorman is accused of shooting to death his three young sons. Clayton, Hunter, Chase, they were all under the age of eight. The deadly shootings happened back on June 15th of this year. Police body cam captured what police saw as they ran to the scene at the home, which is right outside of Cincinnati. His name is Chad Dorman. Chad Dorman. Stand up! Stand up! Moving, moving, hold it. Stand up! Stand up now! Stand up! Can I roll over? I ain't gonna hurt you. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna hurt nobody. You got anything on you? No, I ain't got nothing, man. Phone, that's it. Pretty wild that he would say he's not gonna hurt anyone after allegedly killing his sons execution style with a rifle. By the way, he's even accused of chasing one of his boys down, bringing him back to the house, and killing him. During Dorman's arraignment hearing, prosecutors say he confessed to planning and carrying out the deaths. He'd reportedly been planning these heinous crimes for months. What we have here is the planned slaughter of three little boys, ages seven, four, and three. The first one shot was a four-year-old shot in the house two times, then sustained two bullet wounds to the head, causing his death. The second child shot was a seven-year-old who fled the residence, ran some 300 feet from the residence, and was gunned down from behind by the defendant. He then approached this little boy who was injured, incapacitated, alive, and shot him in the head twice from close distance. There were, there were power burns on the boy's head. And then he went after the three-year-old. And there was a startle with the mother. He ripped the child from the mother's arms and put a bullet in his head. Close range. I can't go into a whole lot of facts, all right, because this is a death penalty case. And my goal is to have this man executed for slaughtering these three little boys. Now, the boy's mother was also shot during this incident with a bullet hitting her hand. Dorman faces nine counts of aggravated murder, plus other kidnapping and felonious assault charges. He faces the death penalty if convicted, and he has pleaded not guilty. I want to bring in right now long crime correspondent and host of Crime Fix, Anjanette Levy, to talk a little bit more about the biggest updates from this week's motions hearing. Anjanette, good to see you. Uh, first, let me just start off before we even get into the motions. My understanding is. You know about this area and some of the players, right? Yeah, I, I live in Ohio, and I, I do know some of the players in this case, Jesse, and thanks for having me. This is a horrible case. I mean, we cover so many crimes here on Law & Crime that are just absolutely disturbing. This one boggles the mind. Anytime we cover these cases where parents kill their children, it's so hard for all of us to wrap our heads around this, especially this one, since... Chad Dorman was planning this for months. That is what he told detectives. For many months, he was plotting this out. And these are defenseless, helpless little boys that he was supposed to be loving and taking care of. As a parent, it's your job to protect your kids. And he was not doing that. Yes, he has pleaded not guilty. But I think it's quite clear from the evidence that we have, he did it. Uh, just exactly what his defense will be it has not yet been made clear to us. Yeah, and I 100% agree with you. Cover murders and the worst kinds of crimes every day, but it's the ones against children that, I don't know, for me, they're the ones that resonate the most, they're the ones that are most difficult to shake, the ones maybe the hardest to understand. Um, now, just to be clear, before we get to the what happened in the hearing, we have not gotten any more information about a motive, right? That hasn't been identified by prosecutors? You know, I think this is just something he said he had been plotting uh, for a long time. I think this is somebody who's really disturbed. And to think that he was sitting around for months and thinking, this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to do this, uh, is just beyond the pale. So yep. uh, not exactly 100% clear on that motive other than 
This is something he wanted to do. Um, and, you know, think about the mother in this case. She's sitting there watching her children be slaughtered. She's obviously trying to do something to protect them. And she gets hit with a bullet. So this is a guy who's got a lot of rage, quite obviously. Hey, everybody, this is a Morgan & Morgan legal alert. Evidence shows that Google has allegedly violated the privacy of millions of Americans via incognito mode. Your personal information and data may have been unfairly collected and then used for profit. As America's largest injury law firm, Morgan & Morgan has recovered over $20 billion in compensation for clients, and they may be able to help you fight for justice. If you've used incognito mode in Google's Chrome internet browser, you can find out if you have a claim in only a few clicks by visiting www.forthepeople.com slash LC Google. It only takes a few minutes to sign up and find out if you have a claim. It's, uh, it's unthinkable and it's unimaginable to, to say the least. Um, my understanding though, with respect to the legal case is that there were more than two dozen motions that the judge is looking through filed by both, by both by the prosecutors and the defense and my understanding is that the judge hasn't officially ruled on any of them yet, but we are learning a little bit more about them. And Jeanette, mm -hmm. talk to us about uh, first what Dorman is trying to argue he should be able to wear and not wear in court. Well, he doesn't want to wear restraints. And we see that that's a pretty common thing in cases uh, where he should not have to wear restraints in front of the jury. And I think that we can agree that that's probably something that he should be allowed, you know, the judge should permit that when there's a jury in the room, he should be able to appear without restraints. A lot of times uh, the defense attorneys will argue that even pre-trial they should appear without restraints because those images go out on the news and people see them. He was in street clothes yesterday and, you know, he's got the, you know, little belt with the shackles and the handcuffs and all of that stuff. The judge said uh, in court that, look, I've, I'm hearing he was, he's been a model citizen in jail. He's not been a behavioral um, issue for the people in the jail. He's, he's behaved. I think it's interesting because a lot of times we see people accused of heinous crimes. Once they get into this institutionalized environment, they, they are model inmates. Maybe that's what they need. I don't know. He could be receiving medication. I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming... He may have some mental health issues. Uh, so there are a lot of things probably going on that we're not privy to. But he wants to appear in street clothes and not wear restraints. And this is not surprising to me because his lawyer, Greg Myers, is somebody I've uh, kind of been in contact with or known sort of through the court system for a while because he represents and has represented a lot of people accused of very heinous crimes heinous crimes, including Jake Wagner in the Pike County massacre. So um, this is a guy who's been around the block. He knows what he's doing. He's like the chief trial counsel with the Ohio Public Defender's Office. And he routinely files motions such as these when he's representing a client saying, my guy shouldn't be seen in these restraints because you're going to paint a really bad picture of him in front of the jury. So a lot of times what they'll do, and I know what they did in the Pike County case, they have this like vest that they put on them and they put it on underneath their clothes. And if they get out of line or do anything wrong or pose a harm or a, a threat to the public in the courtroom, they can zap them mm. and all these volts go in there. Um, there was another case that we covered here on Law and Crime, Anthony Kirkland. He was a big behavior problem in the jail. He was, he's like, he's nuts. I mean, the guy, yep. he, I remember he that murdered one. I remember that one. horrible yep. little girl. He's a horrible person. Like he's just the worst of the worst. And they had this, um, belt that they put on him because he, there, there were times they had to strap him to like a gurney and wheel him into court. Uh, we were like, what the heck? Like literally he's like strapped into this like like, restraint chair. And so they had a, um, thing on him. And I remember <laughs> the judge, Pat Dinkelocker said to him during the sentencing hearing, he's like, you're going to sign this piece of paper basically saying, you know, that you've got a, a thing on your leg. And if you basically are out of line or you try to act up in this courtroom, the deputies can zap you and it's going to be like 80,000 volts or something crazy going into your body. And you'll probably defecate and urinate yourself right here in the courtroom. So, wow. I mean, there there are a lot of things they can do to... Um, ensure that the the prisoner or the inmate is not seen in restraints in front of a jury. And those are two of the things, the vest and the 
stun cuff bracelet thing on the leg. Yeah. And just to, you know, explain a little bit more what you said about what the judge said here, he, he was quoted as saying, Mr. Dorman has uh, not been disruptive in any fashion at the county jail. He's not yeah. caused any problems. He's been in the courtroom twice and has been very compliant. That will weigh in on the methods of restraint that I will consider at issue at this time. By the way, uh, Anjanette, you covered Pike County? Didn't know that. Um, let me... <laughs> Um, you should say that's an inside <laughs> joke to all of us around here. Listen, so I don't Anjanette, like Anjanette, if it wasn't for Anjanette, we wouldn't probably have known about Pike County. We wouldn't have gotten all the details. It was Anjanette's case. I like to tease her about it because that was your... Uh, that was yours. That was yours. That was the one you covered. Yeah, but, there's like a, there's a behind the scenes thing that goes on with this. So yeah. um, we'll just all say all I have to say is are two words. Sam Goldberg. Enough said. <laughs> all right. And we'll leave it at that. All right. So there was another big issue about jury selection. Who's going to be selected? What questions they're going to be asked? What did we know about that? Yeah, so Jesse, the defense is asking for a couple of different things here. They want individual voir dire. That means you have all these jurors sitting around. Maybe they bring a, you know several hundred of them in. And instead of just kind of throwing them in the box and doing things the way they normally do, they bring in each juror individually. And really, I mean, for this case, there's going to be an added layer of jury selection anyway, because this is a death penalty case. So they will have to have what's called uh, death qualified jurors. So before you even get to jury selection, they're going to have to whittle a pool down to maybe like 100 people, 100 jurors, potential jurors who have been questioned and who they've said who've said, I can even if I don't like the death penalty, I'm morally against it. I can follow the law and impose it if I see that see that it's warranted in this case and that the state has proven the elements for uh, the death penalty. So um, they want them questioned individually. I don't think that that's unusual. We saw that as well in the Pike County case, at least in George Wagner's trial. They brought the jurors all in individually. They interview them. It takes maybe like 20 minutes a person, sometimes longer if issues arise. They also want people who maybe have been convicted felons and served their time to be on the jury. Typically, you don't see something like that. And, and I'm going to say this because a lot of times they don't want convicted felons on juries. And there was one case here um, in Kentucky, actually, where Shana Hubers, uh, you probably remember that case, her conviction was vacated and she got a new trial. She got a second trial because one of the jurors um, didn't disclose that he had a felony conviction on his record. It was like something about child support or something. So she got a new trial for that. It didn't work out very well for her in the end because she got a heavier sentence. But, um, you know, a lot of times they'll frown upon that and they don't want people who have had criminal records on the jury. But I think that you could see like a defense attorney thinking, you know what, there's somebody who's done some time and they should be able to serve as a juror. And maybe this is somebody who can understand where we're going to be going with our case because they've been through the system. Yeah, a couple of things there, right? So traditionally, like you said, felons wouldn't be able to sit on a jury. The Ohio law actually provides a way that you can restore those rights. Um, and I would imagine for the defense here, they're probably saying, well, these are people who committed really bad crimes. They serve their time. Maybe they'll have a bit of sympathy. For somebody in Chad Dorman's position, I mean, again, he's accused of murdering his children. Not sure that's the best <laughs> avenue, but but I've just yeah. I don't think personally I've ever heard that before. Thought it was an interesting motion. We'll see which way the, I think that's uh, probably the a judge new decides. Thing. Don't you don't you feel like that's kind of like some kind of new thing that maybe defense that's like kind of making the rounds and like the def like the public defender and defense attorney. I haven't heard circles. it. I haven't heard it. This is the first time I've I mean, heard it. The idea that you wanted convicted felons on. Yeah. I can tell you, Mark Tocalvi, the prosecutor in this case, uh, the elected prosecutor, he he wants Chad Dorman put to death. He has yes. made no bones about that. I mean, Mark Tocalvi, I, I actually have known him for many years. I haven't talked to him in a long time, but I, I can just tell he is all business and, uh, you know. Well, I mean, he, this is a heinous he, case. Yeah, this is Chad what this Dorman's is. This is what he said. He goes, "quote This is a death penalty case, and my goal is to have this man executed for slaughtering these three little boys." Yeah, I mean that's what that's what he wants. So you know what the defense is trying to do here? It just kind of popped into my head. They're going to have a a tough road a road to uh, hoe here. And Jesse, I really think that what they're looking for is maybe one juror 
who in the mitigation phase mm -hmm. is going to say, they're going to be that one juror who's going to say, we need to give him life and not send him to you know, lethal injection or whatever. So, so it would you know? be interesting. It would be interesting if you have somebody who served time in prison knows how bad it is and saying, listen, I think he should go to prison for the rest of his life. That should be his punishment. I don't know. We're probably guessing yeah. here. Um, so, but, but I just I thought it was interesting to going. say the least. I, yeah. I think that's where they're going with it. Don't you? They're like, we need, no, we I, need I, somebody I, who could, who could I, be on I, I our think side. I think it's also the sympathy factor. Like these are people who committed heinous crimes. They might understand where he was coming from, but it could definitely be for the mitigation part. I don't disagree with you. I mean, the death penalty aspect does change a lot of the factors in this case. So I would agree with you. I think it's probably more for the mitigation than the uh, guilt part. Um, by the way, little side issue to talk about that. Not sure if you're aware of this, but one of the motions um, that the defense filed is they want to prohibit any reference to the trial phase. So the first part of this, they don't want any reference to it as the guilty phase. They don't want jurors hearing it as the guilt phase, which, again, pretty unique motion because that is essentially what it is. You have to determine if he committed these crimes before yeah. you can determine whether or not he should be executed. And I've seen Greg Myers file, file this motion in the past. So I think that there are a lot of motions uh, that were argued yesterday. You know, I think there were 41. A lot of these were probably boilerplate motions that are out there. Um, I know I've been on the Ohio Public Defender's website in the past and gone through the, the boilerplate motions that they have posted on there. Um, and I think a lot of people just take those and then they add their own stuff there's like a template and then they add their own arguments or briefs or whatever to these things so um that does not surprise me at all i think that's a pretty common thing and i've seen that in some death penalty cases in ohio because they're trying to like soften the language right so that you don't just go in oh the guilt phase well must be guilty you know right, so right, that right. you're you're kind of conveying a different message about the system to these jurors mm -hmm. I, I can understand that um there was one other big issue we want to talk about the motion concerning all of the photos and videos of the crime scene uh what can you tell us yeah. about that well they they want to they don't want anything that's really really graphic to be seen in front of the jury and i think this is a pretty common motion that defense attorneys in ohio file as well especially in cases where you have something so so heinous and um you know all murders are horrible but this in particular is really heinous i mean it's a, these are children um so i i am i am sure that the crime scene photos and videos in this case are horrific i am sure that greg myers is going to want uh, to minimize as much as he can those really graphic crime scene photos so maybe you show one that's a wider shot or maybe you show one that's this I'm sure the prosecutor is going to say, look, we have to show these because it's going to uh, the premeditation factor or the uh, whatever, because with aggravated murder, there are different elements and premeditation can be one of those elements. The fact that these were kids, that's another element as well. Uh, but they're going to want to show the jury some really, um, I'm sure, and maybe in the penalty phase as well photographs that show just how bad and how brutal this was well we also have to so, remember that prosecutors I, I in, in, prosecutors have to prove their case that a murder was committed and was committed you know by by gunshots so sometimes you have to show those photos just to prove the essential elements of the case that this was murder and those photos and there, i think there's 350 photos and videos in this case some of them are going to be necessary for the jury to see Oh, most certainly, because if you have like the lead detective who's going to be on this or maybe the first deputy who arrived on the scene and he goes in the house to see if anybody can be helped, there's probably body camera footage of really terrible things um, that are going to be shown. And that deputy or whomever was the first to enter that crime scene, they're going to have to say this is how the investigation unfolded. We get there, guys sitting on the porch with a rifle. And then we walk into the house and we saw, saw these little boys in the condition yep. that they were. So um, they have to show that stuff. But I'm sure there are some things in there that Greg Myers would rather the jury didn't see. And so this is not uncommon for a defense attorney to ask for something like this. He, he may not get it, but right. yeah. <laughs> you, know, you have to ask.
And I believe the judge had said, look, in these types of cases, you categorize them. So there are non-gruesome images and videos. There are not particularly gruesome. And then they're gruesome. And that might be a way that you can separate everything out and try to make sense of it. Um, as of right now, Dorman is being held at the Claremont County Jail on a $20 million bond. This trial date is scheduled for July 8th, 2024. And we will see if that date sticks or it will be moved. And Jeanette Levy. Thank you so much for coming on. Everybody check out Crime Fix. Uh, and if I don't see you, happy Thanksgiving. Great seeing you, Janet. You too. Happy Thanksgiving, Jesse. And happy Thanksgiving to everybody watching. Absolutely. Thanks so much. All right, everybody. That is all we have for you right now here on Sidebar. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. I'll speak to you next time.